Please stand and join me in the court worship. We come as people who are sometimes lost and we forget to look to God for guidance. I'm sorry. It's okay?
We come as people who make mistakes, who sin against God and hurt one another, and we need God's grace and forgiveness. Let's sing opening hymn number 73, O oh, Worship the King. Worship and sing, O oh, Worship the King. people up here doing bell choir when 30 seconds later they're supposed to be doing something back there. So that, that would have been, uh, I'll call it my error because uh, uh, we, we planned it that way. <laughs> or I should have at least said, Johan, we're going to need to delay the call to worship, something like that, but I just didn't even think about it. So, so we did have a little Tower of Babel going on in our call to worship, right? <laughs> but as long as it's not a permanent Tower of Babel, we're all right. I have several announcements. Um, first of all, finance is going to meet this Thursday at 1030 in the Fellowship Hall. The head of the CalPAC Foundation is going to come and come talk to us about how investments work with the foundation. And if anyone's interested, you can come and listen. And uh, we, because we're, we're looking at, um, you know, we've had some additional money coming in. So we're just looking at how to be good stewards of our funds. A more important announcement. Doug and Judy Lewis are great grandparents. <laughs> there is a beautiful rose on the altar. Julia, their granddaughter Julia gave birth to a son on Friday morning, and his name is Jace Alexander Flores. It's wonderful. Seven pounds, five ounces, so very healthy. 
Um, Ken is home from the hospital. I did not get an update for you this morning. I apologize about that. Um, Meredith had her procedure on Friday, and she's not positive yet whether it worked or not, so we'll keep her in our prayers for that. Kathy Meyer continues to be on the mend. Kathy Kenley is doing a whole lot better, so that's great. Um, for the flowers on the altar, they are from Sangjin and Young Tae Park, so we give thanks to them. And then this is the last Sunday for our lily order. So coming up, there, there will be a letter going out tomorrow, but Palm Sunday, we're going to do Palm Sunday, but also a little bit of Monday, Thursday, and we're going to have communion. And then we're going to have a Good Friday service at noon. And I know that hasn't been our tradition, but we're going to do a joint service um, with everybody. And um, so that'll be Good Friday at noon. And then, of course, Easter, we will have our service. We will invite you to bring flowers to put on the flower cross before worship. And after worship, we'll have our egg hunt. And then Lori also uh, has suggested we should have a little mini potluck on Easter. So that'll be lots of fun. And like I said, I'll send all of that out in a, um, in a letter so you don't have to memorize it. And just welcome to everyone here today. And for those who are physically present and those who are in Zoom, this is a beautiful, beautiful day today, and it is good to be in worship together. And I forgot to say, that bell choir piece, I think, is the most beautiful bell choir piece I have ever heard. I mean it. It was so beautiful so thank you those who who played it thank you carol for choosing it it was just gorgeous thank you all right let us turn then to our scripture from ezekiel let us read ezekiel chapter 37 verse 1 to 14. the hand of the lord came upon me and he brought me out by the spirit of the lord and set me down in the middle of a valley it was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were dr very dry. He said to me, Murder, can this bone live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And you, will, you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and fresh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy murder, and say, say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four wind, O breath, and breath upon this slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, they stood and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Murder, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, 
have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we pray to hear your voice through the scripture, through the music, through this reflection that I share. We pray that we will hear your word and it will take root within our hearts and souls. Amen. Thomas Long tells the story of a couple in Arkansas who gave their six-year-old son very strict instructions to come home from playing at every afternoon no later than 5 p.m. He was allowed to play with his friends, but his parents were quite serious about his taking responsibility to be home at 5 o'clock. And their son knew this and was very careful to arrive every day on time. But one April Monday, the day after daylight savings time went into effect, the young man was late coming home. And when he finally arrived a few minutes before six, his mother scolded him for being late. You know you are to be home by five, she said, and here it is nearly six. Well, the young man looked very confused and he pointed out the window and he said, but the light, the light, it's the light that tells me when to come home. Well, realizing what had happened, his mother smiled and then explained that the day before the time had been changed, that everyone had reset their clocks, and now the daylight lasted longer. Well, the boy looked quite suspicious at this, and then he asked, does God know about this? There are many times in life when we see or hear things we can hardly believe, and like that young boy, we ask, does God know about this? I had the passage from Ezekiel read to you, but it is paired today in the lectionary with the gospel lesson about the raising of Lazarus. And remember the stories, the, the story, the sisters of Lazarus got word to Jesus that Lazarus is ill, and they wanted him to come right away. But he said that this was for God's glory. And he waited two days before he even started the journey to their house. And when he arrived in Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had been buried for four days. Now the understanding in those days was that the soul remained in the body for three days. So the fact that Jesus came on the fourth day was to make the point that Lazarus was truly dead. Martha goes to meet Jesus and tells him that if he had come sooner, Lazarus would not have died. And you can just hear the heartbreak that she was feeling as she said that to Jesus. But then Jesus tells her that her brother will rise again. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. Those who believe in me will never die. So they go together to the grave, and Jesus tells them to take away the stone. So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and prayed, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let them go. And then the scripture says, Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. They worried that by performing these signs and miracles, more people would start believing in him. So they started to plot to kill Jesus. They worried 
that by performing these signs and miracles, more people would start believing in him. So they started to plot to kill Jesus. I wonder if they asked each other, does God know about this? Did they not see God's agency in the miracle that Jesus wrought? Well, I chose to have this passage from Ezekiel read aloud because the image of the dry bones is another way of visualizing new life and resurrection, the miracles that God can create in life. And it's just a passage that I love. Ezekiel writes, in the time of exile, the Assyrians and Babylonians had a strategic practice of selective deportation, meaning they focused primarily on priests, religious leaders, artisans, and the nobility. And by removing these political, spiritual, and economic leaders, those who remained in the homeland were less tempted to revolt and lacked the leaders who might push them into it. So it was probably a good move on their part. Ezekiel was part of that selective deportation. For those who went into exile, I wonder if they felt that sense of disbelief and also asked, does God know about this? They wondered what life was going to be like. They questioned, what do we have left? Where is God in the midst of these trials? But God told Ezekiel to prophesy to the dry bones. And here's that passage again, or part of it. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. It would seem that God did indeed know about this, and that in the midst of loss and grief, Dry bones came to life. There are many ways of looking at the dry bones in our lives. The failure and defeat, the lack of faith, the lack of hope, the lack of vision for what could be. But God calls us to a vision of new life new chances, a new chance for peace, a new chance for justice, a new way of living life. The Dead Poets Society is one of those movies that I'm very fond of, even though I actually haven't seen it for a while. And it's got quotes in it that just pop into my head from time to time. And someone mentioned it recently, and I don't even remember why. It could have even been someone in this congregation. 
But I was reminded of one of the lessons the main character taught where he told the young men, carpe diem, seize the day. In the movie, John Keating is the name of an English teacher at this fictional male boarding school in Vermont. And that character is played by Robin Williams. And he teaches these young men about poetry. And he catches their imagination and their loyalty. And he tells them, no matter what anyone else may tell you, words and ideas can change the world. Words and ideas can change the world. And Keating is very fond of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, which happens to also be a favorite of mine ever since I read it in college. And at one point, he quoted this favorite of Walt Whitman's poems. O oh me, O oh life, of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish, of myself forever reproaching for myself, for who more foolish than I, and who more faithless? Of eyes that vainly crave the light, of the objects mean, of the struggle ever renewed, of the poor results of all of the plodding and sordid crowds I see around me, of the empty and useless years of the rest, with the rest me intertwined. The question, O oh me, so sad, recurring, what good amid these, O oh me, O oh life? But then there is given the answer. That you are here, that life exists in identity, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. And Robin Williams then asked these young men, what will your verse be? What will your verse be? That words and ideas make a difference. But what will your verse be? There's a documentary on Frederick Douglass called Five Speeches of Frederick Douglass. I highly recommend it. But it describes what was his verse. It says that when he was a child, he was being taught to read. But then his master forbade his wife to continue teaching him, saying it was unlawful, unsafe, that slaves would become unmanageable if they were taught to read and thus of no value to the master. Now this reminds me of the Robin Williams character teaching the young men that words and ideas make a difference. But this is the negative side of it. The slave owner knew they make a difference, so he refused to let his slaves be taught. He was trying to control them by not providing words and ideas. And to me, it's a little similar to some of the book banning going on in this country right now, where people are trying to control what information other people have. But this prohibition, rather than discouraging Frederick Douglass, made him want to read all the more. So he did it surreptitiously. Bits and pieces of newspaper, bits and pieces of the Bible. He would trade bread to poor white children who could teach him. Dry bones come to life. Tendons and flesh appear on those dry bones. And he read in one of the papers that there were abolitionists up north. And when he turned 20, he escaped by train to the north. And he went to an abolitionist meeting, and while there, he just felt compelled to speak, since he was the only one there who had actually experienced slavery firsthand. And the crowd was so moved by what he had to say that they asked him to come back the next day and speak again. That started a life where public speaking and publishing books was a means to an end. And he indeed experienced, like the fictional John Keating said, that value of words and ideas. 
He wrote his verse. He wrote his verse. But in his life, he continued to see fields of dry bones and despaired many times in his life. When President Lincoln emancipated the slaves and when the war was done, Douglas had some hope. The dry bones came to life. And then came the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and concerted political effort by means of segregation and denying voting rights. And again, trying to deny access to words and ideas. But Douglas kept fighting for equal rights for black people as well as for women, including voting rights, until the day he died. And he was buried in an African Methodist Episcopal church where he had been active. And in fact, his faith was deeply important to him. And he described his time of conversion in his final biography, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. Here is his story as he told it. I was not more than 13 years old when in my loneliness and destitution, I longed for someone to whom I could go as to a father and protector. The preaching of a white Methodist minister named Hanson was the means of causing me to feel that in God I had such a friend. He thought that all men, great and small, bond and free, were sinners in the sight of God, that they were by nature rebels against his government and that they must repent of their sins and be reconciled to God through Christ. I cannot say that I had a very distinct notion of what was required of me, but one thing I did know well. I was wretched and had no means of making myself otherwise. I consulted a good old colored man named Charles Lawson, and in tomes of holy affection, he told me to pray and to cast all my care upon God. This I sought to do, and though for weeks I was a poor, broken-hearted mourner, traveling through doubts and fears, I finally found my burden lightened and my heart relieved. I loved all mankind, slaveholders not accepted, though I abhorred slavery more than ever. I saw the world in a new light, and my great concern was to have everybody converted. My desire to learn increased, and especially did I want a thorough acquaintance with the contents of the Bible. This is Frederick Douglass's witness. The time when he sought faith and found it, and found that with that faith he had a foundation that carried him through his entire life. Frederick Douglass is one of the heroes of our nation. He knew he had worth and value when other men said he didn't. He knew he was a child of God and precious in God's sight. And he felt called to try and make a difference, to write his verse, to bring dry bones to life. And so, my brothers and sisters, I say to you today, what will your verse be? Let us pray. O oh Lord, we give thanks for words and ideas. We give, those for the, we give thanks for those who teach us. We give thanks for those who encourage us to learn and to grow, to speak out, to be a witness to our faith and to justice and to love and to grace and to peace. We pray in thanksgiving, Lord, but may we not be content just to value the gift, but to use the gift and to be guided by your Holy Spirit. Amen.
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Put out your power. We have some prayer request. Ken came home and he is getting better. Meredith had an epidural. Kathy Meyer continued to, re to recuperate. Kathy Kinney is recovering well, but we should keep praying for them until they are fully re recovered. Also, we give thanks for birth of Jace Alexander Flores great grandson of Doug and Judy. Let us pray. Love God, we believe you make breath enter us and we will come to life. Thank you for gathering in such a beautiful church and worshiping together. We offer you every worry and stress during the week. Please cover our anxiety and struggle with your right hand. We trust that you come in close with your comfort and surround us with the peace of your presence. We believe that all things work together for good for those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. May we walk into your plan by helping each other. By doing so, we want to be a more beautiful church community in your eyes. We pray for the members who are struggling with health problems even at this moment. You heard their crying, you know their suffering. So we need, we need your help for their fully recovery. Please touch their suffering with your love and mercy and bring healing and restoration for them with your almighty. You're the only hope we know to have you're the only help we have with heavenly peace. We know you're always with us, which is our confession of your love. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, amen. Let us pray Jesus taught us together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us, give us trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in singing our final hymn, Let Us Plead for Faith Alone, number 385 in the hymnal. question whether God is present with us, where we lose faith or lose hope, and we're like those dry bones. But God calls out to us and renews our strength, renews our strength, renews our vision, and asks us to be a witness to the world. So may we go out being willing to write our verse of witness and faith and hope and love. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.